But Pioneer has become so much more than this in the intervening year. Pioneer is a virtual, but also very real community of like-minded orthopedists striving to help not only themselves, but one another. With the latest video conferencing and educational technology, as well as a groundbreaking online platform, SICOT's Pioneer events, activities, and resources are reaching every corner of the globe, with over 55,000 views of our webinars so far. We're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand Pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time and coming soon. Our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT diploma exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. Right, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gents. I'm Bekas Kanduja. I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon in Cambridge, UK, and one of the founders of SICOT Pioneer, and also the president-elect for SICOT. And it's indeed a pleasure to welcome all of you logging in from various corners of the world to this webinar. Now, in the COVID world of non-contact domains, we've certainly embraced digital competitiveness with the launch of SICOT Pioneer. And through this platform, We've done over 75 events, and we've had over 100,000 views from over 110 countries around the world. So big thank you to all of you for joining in and following us. Today's webinar is on AI, and this is the second one in the series, but specifically on wearable devices in optimizing rehab protocols. And we're very thankful to the faculty and the team from Brazil and to Dr. Sasindar, Dr. Omar and Dr. Rehman for collecting such fantastic faculty to come onto this webinar, along with the chair of the rehab committee and also the Brazilian Society for the Collaboration and the Stella faculty for giving up their time to come and, in, come and teach us on this webinar. And I'll let the moderators introduce them to you in a minute. Now we'll try and make this as interactive as possible. So please do post in your questions. And if you can't join us today, then you can access all this with our on-demand platform that we have for Sikot Pioneer. Once again, a big thank you to the faculty, to the team for organizing this, and to all of you for joining us. And over to you guys. Thank you so much, Vikas, for that warm introduction. My name is Alarika Rojas, and I'm the chair of the Sikot Rehabilitation Committee. Uh, today, with our young members of our committee, we are organizing a really wonderful topic, which is uh, something that is interesting to all of us. The use of artificial intelligence and the importance of wearable devices in optimizing rehabilitation protocols. This is the first webinar from the CCOT Rehab Committee of this year, and I can assure you that there will be many more such webinars in due course during this year. We have a fantastic faculty, as Vikas has already said, from the US, from UK, and from Brazil. And we're especially pleased because we are collaborating for the first time with Abrafito, which is the Brazilian Association of Physiotherapy. And we have the president of Abrafito to give us a few words as well. So over to you, Aline, for your welcome message. And I wish all of you a wonderful webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Aline, president of Abrafito, Brazilian Association of Physical Therapy Orthopedic. And uh, I would like to thank SICO for the opportunity to collaborate 
on this webinar. I am hopeful that the example set by SICO will inspire other health societies to work more closely to a multidisciplinary collaboration. So, once again, thank you and uh, welcome to this webinar, and I hope you, you enjoy this. Thank you, Eileen. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone over the globe. I'm uh, Dr. Zain Rahman from Worcester Royal Hospital, and I'm one of the members of the Orthopedic Rehabilitation Committee in CCOT, and I'll be steering through the webinar today. So I will first, I would like to introduce Dr. Samus Desri Sasinda. She's assistant professor at uh, Bhujjuri Hospital, India, and uh, she's a quite active member of Orthopedic Rehabilitation Committee and the Shoulder and Bow Committee of CCOT. So I would like to invite her for introducing the artificial intelligence and its role in orthopedics. Thank you. Over to you. Good evening, good afternoon uh, to everyone around the globe and the viewers, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and experts in the field of orthopedics and rehabilitation. It is with great pleasure and anticipation that I welcome you to this international webinar in artificial intelligence and wearable devices in optimizing rehabilitation protocols. Today, we embark on a journey into the realm of cutting edge technology and innovation exploring how sensor technology and artificial intelligence are revolutionizing the landscape of rehabilitation. Our distinguished speakers will delve into the key topics from the application of sensor technology in monitoring joint functionality to the precision of AI-powered gait analysis and the integration of wearables into daily exercises. Together, we will uncover the potential of these advancements to enhance the patient outcomes and optimize rehabilitation protocols. Today's rapidly evolving world, the integration of technology into healthcare is more crucial than even before. As orthopedic surgeons, we constantly strive to enhance artificial intelligence and leveraging the wearable devices to our patients to present a remarkable opportunity to achieve this goal. By harnessing the power of this sensor technology, into the joint functionality and movement patterns and rehabilitation progress. Uh, we will be able to give more better treatment strategies, especially personalized and effective strategies for our patients, especially in the post-operative rehabilitation. Moreover, the integration of this wearable devices into daily exercises will empower our patients to take an active role in the recovery journey, promoting adherence to the rehabilitation protocols and fostering better long-term outcomes. As we dwell into these topics today, let us recognize the profound impact of that technological advancements can have an optimizing rehabilitation protocols to improve the lives of a patient. With this, uh, quickly introducing about the basics of uh, uh, basics and importance of the AI in rehabilitation, uh, I would like to. Uh, Next, go to the other speakers and uh, swiftly move on to the discussion part. Okay, th thank you, Samu. Uh, so I would like to introduce to our first speaker. We have very interesting talks coming on and uh, the question sessions can be at the end. If we get time, we can uh, take some of the questions meanwhile. So our first speaker is from USA, Mr. Suhail Ask uh, Ashkahani Asfahani. He will be talking about, he's an assistant professor at Harvard Medical University. And he will. He's a director of the Foot and Ankle Research and Innovation Lab at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, he'll be talking about the sensor technology and its application in monitoring joint function functionality. Over to Mr. Sohail. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm honored to be here among all of you guys, experts in the field, and uh, happy to to start my presentation. Should I share my screen or or you share the screen? Uh, yeah, you just, can just share. ask. You can see. Can you see my screen? Yes. And now. Yes. Yeah, is it okay? Yeah. Perfect. We carry on. Thank okay. you so much. So I will start with um, uh, without any further ado uh, on this topic, sensor technology 
and uh, the application of the sensor technology in uh, monitoring joint functionality. Uh, these are my disclosures um, and all updated on uh, the Academy website. So starting with the background, and uh, I'm sure you all are um, aware of most of these things and I'm repeating some of these things, but uh, probably good uh, as a reminder for, for all of us. And then uh, I will try to share some of my experience and my two cents with all of you experts and all those uh, who are as audience on this call. Uh, so sensor technology, we call it cutting edge technology. Um, I'm not sure if it is still cutting edge because uh, it's been a while that uh, everyone is, is working on sensors uh, every day. Uh, something new happens, and uh, it's a buzzword these days in, in orthopedic practice. Uh, the importance of sensor technology in joint uh, preservation and uh, restoration is, uh, uh, is, is obvious to everyone, and there is a growing need for, for this. And as you can see with the aging population, with the athletes and the uh, professional athletes mainly who, who are in need for, for this in terms of like monitoring uh, their health and uh, preventing the injuries and mainly overuse injuries. You see even in, in clubs, in sports clubs, every day there is a new technology coming uh, to, to help the, the coaches. And moreover, for, for health education, uh, which I will talk further as we move forward with this. What are the different applications of sensor technology? I will just provide some bullet points um, that can probably uh, give us some, some insight into what I'm going to talk about, though it will be just uh, the tip of the iceberg. On the right side, you see some of the pictures that I shared. Some of them are from our own studies in, in uh, mass gen, and some of them are uh, like the, the Apple Watch is not ours, by the way. But as you can see, everything these days we wear or we use, it can be earbud, it can be a watch, it can be like just some markers on different parts of the body uh, can be used to transfer and transmit data for our healthcare monitoring and uh, specifically joint monitoring. Um, in the operation room, pre and post op, uh, uh evaluation of the patients can can also rely on sensors gait analysis um, we recently did a very interesting analysis on using uh earbuds uh the picture on the right um and compared it with routine gait analysis uh machines uh and methods and very interesting that with that small earbud we could assess a lot of the uh, parameters and variables that we wanted to assess with those big machines and cameras and with a very good accuracy. Uh, and we try to validate it, which is a very important thing in accepting a sensor as a tool in our practice. As mentioned, sports medicine uh, is, is a, a huge realm for the use of sensors. Uh, variable devices uh, these days, for uh, like many, many companies at least, uh, and, and many research centers and academic centers have focused on using variables to improve patient physician communication. In other words, when the patient wears uh, one of these sensors in, in different parts of the body and for different joints monitoring, um, it can provide a continuous uh, data transport or transfer to, to the physicians and decision makers. To, to change the plan, to, to make further decisions. Telemedicine and remote monitoring, uh, again, falls into the same category. Uh, these days, mainly after the pandemic, you saw that uh, most of us could not have contact with our patients and we had to somehow find a way to, uh, to make sure our patients are doing well. So these sensors could be, uh, the hands of the doctors uh, in our patients to to provide physical exams, to provide um, uh, further examination on the joints and the MSK system. Obviously, uh, everyone is aware of the use of sensors in research. Recently, um, uh, this smart buzzword 
um, uh, have been used in publications and in the literature, uh, which uh, stands for self-monitoring analysis and reporting of technology, and have been used a lot for, for sensors, mainly in, in orthopedic practice. This slide looks very wordy, but I, I will summarize it. Uh, as mentioned, uh, it's just the tip of the iceberg. So I was thinking, where should I focus? And I thought, okay, so here, it will focus on joint functionality, and I will try to more talk about that. But obviously, there is overlap uh, in the use of sensors for different uses. Uh, we have different types of sensors. Um, just just going over the, the the types, strain gauges, accelerometers, gyroscopes, force sensors, and load sensors, flex sensors, magnetic sensors, pressure sensors, EMG sensors, and optical sensors. On the right down corner. Uh, you see one of uh, our recently developed optical sensors, but it is uh, actually a force sensor combined with optical. So though uh, there are different topics for these sensors and different uses for these sensors, but most of the recent devices uh, use a combination of these sensors. And each of them uh, are, are used for a certain uh, uh point and certain purpose. Magnetic sensors, which is one of uh, my at least favorite ones, um, are those sensors that use uh, Earth's uh, magnetic field. The reason I'm mentioning this specifically is like when you combine magnetics with accelerometers and, and gyroscopes uh, and even force sensors, uh, you will get a very uh, high accurate, highly accurate, and low biased uh, data from, from uh, your patient. And this will help not only in, in, in practice, but also in research when you are trying to validate uh, different methods of uh, joint monitoring and trying to, to find out if the patient is doing well or not. Um, as I will move forward, you will see like we, we, we use a lot of pressure sensors or force sensors uh, there are some caveats to them, which I do want to mention as we uh, continue uh, on this talk. Um, other newly, well, they are not new in the engineering world, but in, in our field, at least, uh, they have been used uh, recently, at least in the past uh, five, six years, um, mainly piezoresistive sensors uh, for those patients who who use implants uh, for those who don't uh, we don't want to have sensors that have contact with the material and we want to uh, monitor the performance of the mater material capacitive sensors inductive sensors they are some of these sensors that you can see on the right side up uh, well, that's not our study, but that was a very interesting study that uh, uh, our, our colleagues from Japan uh, use capacitive sensors to uh, detect ankle instability. And they tried to validate it uh, uh, on, on cadaver specimens, and uh, they showed a high accuracy for that. Uh, on the right down, uh, there, is a, there is an ultrasound picture. Most of us might think ultrasound uh, might not be considered as uh, sensors or at least traditionally like among the electrical sensors. But uh, I would say ultrasounds, uh, ultrasound waves can be used as sensors. And in that study, which was done by, by uh, our team and, and some of my great colleagues, uh, we try to use ultrasound to uh, assess ankle instability and even find a sign, which we call the gap penetrance sign, to see if af after the, the operation, uh, we have uh, actually uh, uh, reduced the instability very well and there is no mal reduction. So I would, I would also include ultrasound among the sensors. And uh, AI. So uh, this is this is uh, very challenging for me to discuss the use of AI in sensors because uh, uh, well I have the passion to use AI in in uh, uh, the majority of uh, decision support tools that we are developing these days. 
But why AI is useful in sensor technology? Uh, I have some bullet points here, which I will go over with some further uh, explanations. Of course, AI is, is used for, for data analysis. So it does improve the quality and accuracy of data analysis. And one of the most important things in AI, which I myself am still failing to, to understand the process, as, as you know, we call AI the black box, though recently uh, scientists have focused on explanatory AI. But it's like sometimes uh, we don't see something among the, the data. Like it can be imaging data, it can be text data. Human eye misses it. As you can see on the right uh, down corner, there, uh, we did a study on anchor fracture uh, detection using AI. And uh, we used some deep learning algorithms to detect a simple anchor fracture. Um, but uh, I remember in our database, which included over 2,000 patients, uh, uh, we uh, missed about 100 patients. Or in this data, it's like 1,000 patients and we missed about 70 patients. And when when the, the, the AI algorithm uh, using a saliency map showed us the location of the fracture, it was like, wow. So there was a fracture and an expert surgeon missed it or even a radiologist missed it. So AI can help find something, some, some of the changes in the data that might not be obvious to human eye. Making prediction models, very interesting topic. Uh, and and uh, AI can definitely help in monitoring and modifying and anal uh, analyzing the large data sets compared to the routine conventional statistics that uh, usually are not based on large data sets. Uh, surgical precision, um, as, as you all have the experience of using AI during the operation for, for placing the, the jigs, placing the guys, placing the implants in the right location, not just in robotic or, uh, routine, uh, surgeries that include implants, but recently with the minimally invasive surgeries that most of the time the, the, the surgeon has to go in blindly. And AI, uh, with the help of sensors and imaging, can can help with uh, providing good information. But uh, real time feedback during the surgery, we have recently uh, uh, experienced uh, in some MIS surgeries that uh, when when you are trying to to, to perform a, a, a simple osteotomy, and uh, sometimes you might cut a lot. Sometimes your cut is not enough. And you can use AI to, to determine when you should stop or when you should continue. That was a simple, simple example, but, uh, a lot of other critical feedback can be, um, uh, uh, obtained or can be expected during the surgery using AI. And, uh, one of my favorite topics, customized rehab plans. And I would expand it to customized uh, management plans because based on AI data and mainly retrospective large and granular data, AI can provide uh, a kind of like more experienced and expert idea to help the clinicians uh, make the decision and uh, plan for management of the patient. In other words, I would, I would always use this example. AI is like a kid and you are giving it 20,000 uh, examples to learn how the, the patient can, can perform and AI for the next 20,001 patient or 20,000 and first patient will say, based on my previous 20,000 patients, I think this one will be like this. So it's like a, a new clinician with the experience of 20,000 patients helping another clinician make a better decision. Variable technology integration. Um, AI, uh, together with variables, uh, can, can expand the data set we have. But, uh, some of the pictures I, I provided here are from our own studies, which we, in which we try to simulate the, the conditions before we, uh, dive into the real procedure. One of the main things, as my third bullet point here says, is, um, testing it, even not on real real human body, 
but also sometimes using simulations to to see if the outcome is as you expected. Uh, these studies that I provided here are finite element studies, uh, but there are different methods of simulation that uh, uh, can, can we are help you. Getting short of time, so if we can conclude in a few more. Seconds. I will wrap up in in two yeah, minutes. If that's perfect. Um, and the last thing, automated documentation. Uh, I think uh, one of the main main um, uh, and powerful characteristics of AI is to be able to manage large data sets uh, in a short period of time compared to human. What is needed here and what is the key factor is like that AI algorithm, that AI protocol should be built based on a reliable and valid data. And to make that database reliable, uh, that database has to be prepared by an expert. Uh, some of the challenges, uh, Obviously, variables and AI algorithms can be built for anything, but there has to be an unmet need and a buy-in for this. Ethical challenges, um, how to use it in practice, how it can, how these can change patients' quality of life, how we can uh, create predictive anal analysis methods using large data sets. We need expert annotation again. I insist on that. Uh, personalized medicine, as mentioned, patient specific management plans, um, is, is one of the directions that most of our AI algorithms should go, uh, towards them. Using virtual reality, augmented reality together with AI is not only for training the surgeons, but also for improving patients, uh, literacy and education. Um, these, these, uh, methods and techniques should be affordable. Uh, I insist on cross-disciplinary collaboration. Without engineers, physicians cannot do anything. Without physicians, engineers might not have enough insight into it. So uh, uh, scientists should work together to, to make something that is useful for, for our patients. Cost effectiveness uh, is, is one of the key factors and customer discovery before making these solutions uh is uh important and i will i will uh explain later hopefully in questions and answers uh part uh in conclusion four bullet points gaps and unmet needs should be found um there has to be a buy-in interdisciplinary uh work is necessary and everyone should learn the language we lack that a lot these days and we should make sure the database is high quality, validated and tested internally and externally and prepared by experts. Thank you so much. And sorry if I went over time. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. Uh, I think the game, yeah, the sensors are the game changers. They will make a huge difference in the future. Uh, so let's uh, go to our next speaker. And it's Mr. Suhail Chuktai. He's a consultant orthopedic surgeon and medical legal examiner in UK. He holds certification in, in artificial intelligence from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA. He serves as a telehealth and AI expert in UAE, UK, USA, Pakistan, and Ghana. So he'll be talking about artificial intelligence powered gait analysis, precision in movement. Over to you, Mr. Suhail Chuktai. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. I'm uh, really honored to be here. Can I share my screen? Yes, sure. Are you able to see my yeah. slide? Yeah, we can see you can carry on. Thank you. So uh, thank you, C-Court. Thank you, c -Court team for inviting us, uh, inviting me. And I'm really, uh, I feel the, the company is um, quite, um, Experienced, I heard the talk of Dr. Shkani. He has given, shown a lot of uh, wealth of knowledge he has, and probably he would have required more time. Uh, uh, the topic he was touching. So I just want to uh, share an a concept of how AI can change the way gate analysis should be done. Uh, let me just put my marker on the screen. It'll be easier. So. Uh, Quickly, a gait analysis, as we know, it's a systematic study of human walking. We study joints, we study what is a load-bearing pattern, and we also study the neuromuscular coordination. Uh, why we do it? We want to diagnose the neurological and orthopedic disorders 
At the same time, we want to prevent further damage to the musculoskeletal axis. And not only that, there is athletic performance enhancement uh, technology which is benefited from uh, the skate analysis. So the biomechanics we study, we study body mechanics, we study center of gravity, muscle activity, and load bearing patterns. I'm just introducing this point as, as we all know, but I just want to catch up with this and then move on to the, the main topic. So as you know that when we study gait, we study different parts of gait. When we stand up, what is the flat foot loading pattern? Just when we are about to take a stance, just when we take the heel off the ground and just as we take the step up. And then we go further when we are swinging, what is the initial swing pattern? What is the mid swing pattern? And then terminal swing pattern. All of this data can be facilitated by AI embedded systems. So initially we used visual observations. We used to watch and take notes. Is the guy limping antalgic gait or spastic gait? And then we started video analysis, like and watching the same thing on the video and then uh, taking screenshots and making notes. Then we started asking people walking on the platform, which has sensitive indices. As people walk on the platforms, they bear points and we measure the pattern of weight bearing. And how long this, how long the foot spends on the platform and in what pattern, outer side, inner side, and that is temporal and spatial calculation. Then we went on to 3D gait analysis that we took uh, cam, we put reflectors on the arms, on the feet, ankle, toes, elbows, shoulders, and then recorded them and followed the patterns for the reflectors to develop a model of gait. That is very expensive and that is takes a lot of big setup. That's why it never really took off in, in most of the centers. Electromyography is part of gait analysis. We study neuromuscular analysis, especially in polio and post-stroke patients. So what is the need? Why, why we are talking about that we need precision in gait analysis? We want to detect these problems early, not when the child is actually coming with painful limp. At the very first pretext, when the mother notices, the child is not walking the same way. And as you know, the gait is our silent signature. Gait is our subtle announcement. You can tell someone is walking. If you know the person, you can hear him walk or her walk and tell that guy is that. And when he doesn't walk that way, there is some difference do you notice. And that is what is important that gait tells a lot. Neurological and both musculoskeletal conditions. The main thing is that we need accuracy. We need accuracy of the gait analysis. This is not available. This was not available in the previous methods. And then, as uh, Dr. Shkani said, the customized treatment plans. We can devise customized we uh, uh, wearing devices, customized braces, and then uh, the monitoring becomes very precise. We know that how many degrees the patient has improved not just the eyeballing of the patient's improvement. And of course, the performance enhancement and injury. This is again a topic of great interest to me because I've been a cricketer in the past and I still play cricket. And when you do a cover drive, I don't know whether how many of you know cricket. When you do a shot, if your foot lands before you hit the ball, you get caught on the, on the front of the field. But if your foot lands at the time you strike the ball, then you, the ball is rolling down the field. And that is, again, one example of how performance enhancement or accuracy in sports can be achieved through AI-based gait systems. So there is a need for precision. Again, the same topic, we want to do enhanced prosthetic and orthotic designs. As Dr. Ashkani said, understanding the gait in special age groups where the general rules don't apply. And then, of course, personalized interventions. Not everything will fit on the standard, uh, on, 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 on every patient we have to sometimes develop prosthetic uh, uh, devices specialized for certain people. And then this part remains very exciting that we learn a lot through that. So this process is governed by the basic startup data collection, the multivariate stream from the sensors, then the transmission, very, very fast transmission without any lag. The pre-processing means that the noise is removed, the, the redundancy of the data is removed, what is not wanted should be out before we present this data for machine learning. And the machine learning means, first of all, they have normal models. What is a normal gait pattern? And then the machine learning algorithms will compare the normal with the abnormal gait pattern. And that is analysis and then the interpretation of that. That could be outputted as graphs, as charts, and can be sent to prosthetic departments. 
and then we integrate with other third party uh, technology for example telemedicine telehealth and other uh, data sciences so how we use what technology of ai we use in gates analysis uh, as you know that uh, machine learning or deep learning is the essence is the really core of this technology and in that part if you notice that we have a convolutional network in deep learning so the computers think like a brain and they register what is normal at multiple points and any deviation from that is picked as abnormal so this can be multivariate not just one thing at one time if a person is landing on outside of the foot that along with the neck movement that along with the toe position that along with the elbow with the spine that's a multivariate sensor data that can be registered as a normal model and then normal model of the convolutional network of ai can compare how abnormal where exactly abnormal and when the things are improving and what is improving and what is not improving and that way you can really develop a very uh, clever way of finding out what's what's wrong with this patient so the computer vision is the second part of technology we use the video of the peep of the person walking is recorded through different cameras in different dimensions and then that video capture is compared to the normal uh, pattern along with the sensor stream so sensor stream and the video compute technology makes a computer vision that is such an important area that 3d technology before didn't take off because we didn't have ai at that stage so the generative ai the convolutional network the ai is the one which is calculating all that so fast that there is no lag it's not that the person will wait till weeks before the data is analyzed in the same sitting the data is analyzed through the generative type of ai wearable sensors dr shkani said a lot about that i won't go into deep uh, as you know acceler accelerometers gyro sensors force sensors strain and there are many more i want to show you one of the sensors demo here quickly the goniometers uh this is a patient i was examining for neck uh, range of movement from a distance and i used my own software where i incorporated the sensor so i'm examining this patient from a distance and i'm noticing how much range of movement he's is exhibiting while i'm talking to him so flexion extension so this is very electronic and that can be recorded as the maximum movement after physiotherapy how much improvement he has done that can also be recorded so this is uh, this is a use of third party integration with the ai technology you can do from distance and you can see it's very objective it's not that the sideward extension of flexion is good how many degrees how many calibers so data analytics again as you know that all of this ai uses the convolutional network which means that the whole process the multivariate stream the video captured data at the same time the 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 past history of the patient put together that is all analyzed and compared to a normal model through the ai ai has this capacity of putting unstructured data and getting analysis out of that the traditional ai before used structured data but the generative ai uses unstructured data which means that we don't have to do a lot of hard work like we, like we used to do before the robotics and exoskeleton is another technology we use for ai gate analysis here we mount the joints with calibrated machines and find out how much the joint is moving to what degrees at what weight bearing not point. missed but treated in adequate simulation and modeling so again that's why is a way of actually simulating uh, preparing a model and the person to walk through that model uh, we can compare on the live screen so lateral condyle fractures do so present that person of that age group should walk like this and he's not walking like that or she's not walking like that where is the problem that yellow zone can be highlighted is it abductors is it flexors it is uh, glutei all of that can be compared to a normal model and this is the key for the output the natural language processing nlp that is the product of generative ai the new ai that is where we get the novel ideas we don't have to confine ourselves to python language like just what we put in it comes out 
Now we can get the results in a very humanized way. And again, the computer can suggest that this is something new I found, which wasn't in the model. So that is the idea of natural language processing. We generate novel ideas and we create novel reports. The big data integration with AI, again, all of that put together from multi centers, and then we study that, and then we put uh, ethnic uh, ethnic changes, gender changes, how African people walk, how Caucasians walk, how Asians walk, how Chinese walk, all of that put together and then find new variables. The okay. real-time feedback system, I think it was said before, that we can adjust the orthotic implant at the same time. We don't have to call the patient next time. We can get the feedback and make adjustments to the to the braces, to the orthotic implants at the same time. And of course, telehealth and remote monitoring is one of my favorite subjects. I, I designed a lot of softwares in telehealth, and I feel that we can integrate this, then the perspective and the scope can go beyond the practice. We can analyze gait of patient at a distance very effectively. So Thank as you. you know that the case studies in clinical time. practice, yeah. they have, uh, how, how much time have got, uh, Zan? Um, I think we have more than 10 minutes now. Okay, I'll just wrap it up in one minute. Thank so you. cerebral palsy, gait uh, monitoring post-operative recovery, gait abnormalities, lower limb physical therapy, and pre-operative gait analysis, they've been proven to be, if they use AI-based gait analysis, the results can be superior to the ones done without AI. These are the proven case studies. I don't have the time in the 10 minutes to really quote all those examples, but they are the proven studies available. And of course, then the analysis system, the examples, I just want to give you uh, the computer-assisted rehab environment. Karen, that's uh, from, I think, America again, uh, uh, Gate Smart, then Holland Orthopedic and Arthritic Lab, Hole, that's from Stanford, uh, Fastgate, VWALK, and OutWalk from Oxford and various other institutes. They're all models established so we're not talking about something which we are experimenting. We have experimented enough. We've reached a conclusion, and now we are practicing it. So uh, that's how the complex data looks like. If there would be more time at some stage, maybe I can explain that later. But uh, just to summarize that we really gain uh, better accuracy. We diagnose early. We do real-time analysis and feedback and make adjustments. And then we have a very clear quantitative, not object subjective, quantitative data analysis, the advantages of AI-based data analysis. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Chiptai, for your uh, for your talk. I think uh, gait analysis is always a very difficult subject for orthopedic surgeons, so AI will help a lot in this, hopefully. Um, let's move on to our next speaker. He's uh, from UK, Mr. Nuj Banus. He's uh, He has uh, 25 years of experience in uh, physiotherapy. And he works as a physiotherapist at Cambridge University Hospital, and he's doing his PhD on prehabilitation interventions for patients undergoing hip arthroscopy. He will be talking about smart rehabilitation, integrating variables. That's a very interesting topic. Over to you, Mr. Panos. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll try and share my screen. Uh, just give me a sec. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, we can see. You can. Start. Excellent. Thank you. First of all, let uh, me thank Sitcourt for your kind invitation. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be here and be able to contribute to this session. So yes, I'm a physiotherapist by background, been working in Cambridge for the past 18 years, been leading the team of uh, trauma and orthopedic physios. Currently, I've stepped out of my clinical practice uh, to do my PhD fellowship with NIHR. Um, Although my remit is within trauma and orthopedics, um, I've been having special interest in uh, young adult hip surgery as well. So that's why I work with Vikas Kantuja. So today's session is all about uh, wearables and how we can utilize that uh, in um, daily exercises. So we'll go through uh, a small bit around how we use technology within our unit. Um, I'm sure you've heard from the past two speakers about wearable sensors, common types, and then how we can utilize wearables in exercises. So my special interest is within the young adult hip pathologies, and we have an excellent team here in Cambridge led by Professor Vikas Kantuja, and I've been a part of this team since 2010. In terms of um, 
embracing technology uh, as a cohesive unit we have embraced technology in various facets of clinical and research endeavors um we have looked at uh, things like ais and advanced rehabilitation technology within uh, the orthopedic arena and a recent uh, sort of a patent technology was looking at implanting sort of sensors within the hip uh, implants which we commonly use and in terms of uh, its use within rehabilitation, uh, we are uh, looking at um, analyzing uh, adherence and home exercise prescription um, in uh, terms of its use uh, within my uh, rehabilitation study. So we are currently using uh, an app called PhysiTrack. So what are uh, wearable technologies? So uh, these are electronic devices that can be worn as accessories. So nowadays you get things which you can stick onto the skin. You got uh, wearable sensors, which you can embed into your clothing, which can give produce a lot of uh, data, including physical fitness, nutrition, and even sleep. If you look at the history and development of wearable technologies, you, you you know the first one was pretty much found around 1962, which was looking at cardiac monitoring, uh, which was the size of of a briefcase, I would say, and then it has rapidly grown over the years, and uh, you know you got sensors which are as small as your fingertips nowadays, which can capture a lot of data. Now, I think we can all agree to the fact that wearable sensors uh, have grown over the years um, you know, in both clinical and research practice. Now, if you put the term wearable sensors in Google Trends, you can see that it has grown, especially from the year around 2014, it has shown a rapid growth. And I think on, in addition to that, um, you know, things like pandemics like COVID-19 uh, has sort of helped its growth. The type of wearable sensors, uh, we got a chemical sensors, which can capture things like lactate concentration or blood glucose. You got physical sensors, which can measure temperature, pressure, and also electrophysiological ones, which can look at um, EMGs or ECG and cardiac monitoring. In terms of the type of wearable sensors, you the type of data you want to capture for wearable uh, from the wearable sensors, you've got accelerometers which can measure speed, gyroscopes which can look at uh, angular velocities and rotational movements. You've got pressure sensors which can capture pressure changes, um, and also pedometers. I'm sure you have come across this on your smartphones and your smartwatches, which can look at measuring your daily steps. And in terms of it, domains uh, which is used, uh, you know, its utility within. Uh, the medical arena, you got cardiology looking at ECGs and uh, monitoring, and you got uh, wearable sensors being used in patients with a neurology like stroke and Parkinson. There is a lot of evidence and also orthopedic rehabilitation. It also helps in prevention uh, uh, diagnosis, and it can also tailor the exercise program and rehabilitation. So the big question here is why do you want to integrate wearables into exercises? Now, before we delve into that sort of matter, it's quite important to understand what are the main barriers of daily exercises or people trying to do exercises. Now, one of the main things we have found over the years, anecdotally from our clinical experience, as well as our research experience, talking to patients in focus groups or in PPIs, motivation seems to be a major, major barrier. Okay, we all know that physical fitness is important and how we can reduce the risk of uh, risk of developing chronic diseases like osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, and diabetes. But how many adults do actually achieve this target is, is, is a major question here. The UK chief medical uh, officer has recommended at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. But if you look at studies, uh, okay, large so scale studies, we have studies, discussed uh, it has been reported two major seven, elbow fractures: supracondylar and lateral condyle. Actually, uh, need this medial part. epicondyle fractures. Adherence again. Uh, we have seen even in my study, current study, we are uh, doing medial epicondyle fractures. Major issue with exercise interventions. Now we have done a, a narrative review paper which reported of thank you thirty five percent um, patients um, in clinical trials adhering to the exercises. And in similar lines, we have also found 
in our paper publication JAMA recently reporting that only 44% of the trials do actually even measure adherence. And out of that, only 40% of patients uh, actually meet an adherence of more than 70%. So this seems to be a major issue. So the use of variables could address these issues by enhancing motivation, improving adherence, and also tailoring the uh, exercise program by remote monitoring. So it gives a lot of clinical information and data across to the clinician so they can tailor the exercise intervention. Now, the other part is looking at how utility of wearables uh, can help in gait and muscle retraining. You've heard from the previous speakers that it has a lot of utility within that space. We got uh, papers which are looked at uh, improving the abnormal load on osteoarthritic knee joints by giving haptic feedback, we got sensors which can sort of improve their gait pattern. And also in resistance training, uh, wearable technology has a lot of clinical implications in terms of uh, personalizing their goals uh, and improving their exercise adherence. In terms of post-op recovery, we have again seen that wearables have a major uh, major uh, part to play. Uh, the, this is a systematic review which uh, included 24 studies out of which seven were on orthopedic patients. Now it has reported that it is useful, cost-effective and reliable and it also helps in improving patient safety post-operatively. So essentially the take-home messages uh, for, from today's uh, session is that wearable technology is one of the fastest growing technologies of today. I don't think anyone can argue with that. And various types of wearable are available in the market. So you just have to decide what you want to capture by using that. And then you select a particular wearable sensor and, uh, and use it. Wearables can also help in capturing real-time data, personalize exercise regimen, motivate patients, and improve adherence of exercise interventions can also help in monitoring patients post-operatively. And this, I'm sure it will have, uh, ha have a great impact on reducing healthcare cost. So my humble plea to everyone listening to this talk is to embrace technology and innovation, and the sky is the limit. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Neet, for your talk. It was really exciting. I think these variable devices will be the future, quite attractive, but the funding will be the question who will be doing the funding of these expensive devices, especially in the post-op patients. Um, uh, let's move on to the panel discussion, who will be Mr. Rafael Alaiti. He will be leading it. He's a, a musculoskeletal physiotherapist and a researcher from University of Sao Paulo, and he's investigating implementation of digital health in the management of chronic musculoskeletal pain. Over you to, over to you, Mr. Alaiti. Thank you, Zane. Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and to conduct this panel discussion. Uh, I, I am a physical therapist and also the CEO and co-founder of um, Health Tech that use some of these technologies in Brazil to embrace the democrat democratization of rehabilitation here. And I, I try to stick to the time, so I have a few questions just to ignite the discussions among all the, the faculty members. I think that's this, the, the first question is for everyone. Um, it regards the challenges of access of these technologies on minor populations, especially in low and middle income countries. How can we address uh, the significant disparities in access to the advanced rehabilitation technologies, particularly in low and middle income countries? What are the strategies that might help to bridge this gap, in your opinion? I you just that. Everyone respond this one. Um, may, may I take this? Uh, yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. So there is a, a model which is in place in UAE where the insurance company becomes the provider. And we use that for virtual home care systems uh, where the insurance company covers the patient and they include the sensors, the recommended sensors in the insurance cover, like cardiac sensors, like pulse oximeters, like uh, biostatic dressings and all that. 
So that is the way we can probably see to it unless the government sponsors it, unless the state takes care of that. But it's a huge task to ask for the state. So I think at a, at a moderate level, insurance companies can come where I see this successful as in UAE. So this is um, how I see this getting into the market and getting more popular. Once the model is established, once people get trust of that, then they can start buying more and more of it. And the more you buy it, the cheaper it becomes. Thanks. Thank you, Shivan. Thank you. The next one, please. Uh, yes, if I may speak. Of course. You know, do, do you want to okay. go ahead? No, no, you can, yeah. Okay. okay. So, so uh, one, of, one of the, like, I was second, uh, Dr. Sohero, but one of the other strategies that uh, at least we, we try to test and see how it works was first, obviously, like these sensors have to be validated and have to prove that if we use these sensors, like this is also a way to convince insurance companies here, at least in the US. Uh, if you use these sensors, then the costs will be lowered and uh, probably like the quality of life of the patient or the short and long term complications that might happen to the patients will be decreased. So but all these also rely on research. And uh, obviously, if through research it is proven, then uh, it's uh, like highly likely to be accepted by by uh, sponsors, including insurance. Sometimes even the healthcare system, without like even including the insurance companies, will start to use this. Uh, mainly happening in 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 the pandemic uh, era was like some of the patients could not really come in. So even relying on iWatch. Or, or other uh, watch and variable sensors uh, was one of the things that many of the clinicians uh, like considered. Or even like some of the cuffs for, for implant patients or gait analysis using AI. One of the initiatives that we tested was that to use simple cell phone camera to do gait analysis. And we try to develop that. And most of the patients have access to these things. So sometimes without even adding more cost to the patient, we can provide a better healthcare, a more accurate healthcare. And even sometimes you don't need to provide a more accurate or better or comprehensive. Sometimes it's like you need to provide a, a tool that can help the clinicians to find the alarm signs. And then if needed, you go through further examinations. If X-ray, CT scan, MRI is not needed, then you can just uh, detect by observation, even through a cell phone camera, uh, then further examination is not needed. So uh, to summarize in two points, first, I would say uh, through research to support the cost effectiveness and cost benefit of the, the, the solution. Second, to educate physicians and the patients on the different uses of the, these uh, variable and like, combined with AI uh, stuff and, and try to uh, provide and, and let them use it and then come up with feedback. It takes time, but it can happen uh, like that. Please. Great point. Thank you for the answer. And just let me use the point that you bring up to us. Uh, what in our faculty opinions is the barrier of the commercial determinants of health in the implementation of this technology because like in rehabilitation we have a lot of studies proving that telephysiotherapy is cost effective in even non-inferiority to usual physiotherapies in a lot of condition but here in brazil uh, we are just beginning to see some kind of value-based healthcare implementation uh, so, what is your opinion about the difference between fee for service in healthcare and value based healthcare and the impact of it in the implementation of these technologies? Oh, that's a very great point. In fact, like we had a podcast a couple of days ago about value based healthcare and uh, a very interesting point for it. Again, I, I will repeat myself, but uh, I think even to the main decision makers, to the institution, providing uh, good and reliable data, obviously not on 20 patients, on a more and larger database. And one of the recent things that I have experienced is like multi-centric data. So for example, if I in MassGen come up and say, 
this method, this this uh, physiotherapy method, work on the patients we have. So yeah, probably these guys have a conflict of interest or have something in it. They are advocating for it. I say, like, hey, uh, uh, Rafael, are you going to use my method, and then we can also like share the results and see like if in in your center it works then it will provide a better insight because one of the main things for the main decision makers is the insight, is the, is the information. Other than the influence of industry and the influence of financial aspects, obviously, but the, the insight and the, uh, I would call it literacy of the healthcare providers and the patients would, would be very valuable. One more thing I wanted to add uh, to, to, to this was when these multicentric studies happen, obviously there is a cost for it, which is a concern, which is a concern for, for all the like research staff and the clinicians. To provide for that, the insurance will not pay, most of the institutions will not pay, and it's extra work for our clinicians. So that's why most of our clinicians don't even want to do research. Like this is a waste of time. Someone else does it. Like let us just do our work. This is what they say. And I, I found a very good experience partnering with industry. And by industry, I don't mean like large companies like Microsoft, like Google or whatever come in and fund because they, they don't usually do it. They have their own uh, initiatives. And I'm sure Dr. Sorrell has, has some experience to share with us that, but small companies, like I, I work with some uh, Ukrainian young folks who just wanted to build a startup company. Why I'm saying that is like, because if you do one research, two research, three products, then after a while, you have to find a way to, to make it sustainable. Who will continue this? Who will fund this? Who will continue to have this? In, in two seconds, I will finish. Um, the company who has it and the company who wants to partner with you has money in it, has uh, interest in it. And they won't lose their company. They won't lose their assets. And that's why they will support more. I'm not talking about big companies again. I'm talking about the startup companies that can also be a spin off of your institution with your team. And then it can be sustainable. It can have revenue stream. And that's why I mentioned customer discovery and trying to find a business model canvas for each of these models. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, I will try to stick to the time, so I will make just one more. more. You can yeah, have one more question. Thank you. Um, one of the major barriers in implementation and uh, normally can be the perception of the healthcare professions. Uh, what has been the overall response of healthcare professions, especially those in orthopedics? Uh, to the integration of these technologies in practice? Are there concerns and reservations? And how can they be addressed? I think that this is for everyone also. So, so, so if, I, if I take this first, um, that concern is genuine. People are worried that their data is now being used at multiple points. And at some points, the consent is not um, proper. So this is a valid concern. But the trust building is basically starts from the way the, the consultant or the physician or the doctor uh, treats the patient. At that point, if we, the doctor is not properly informed that what is the process of consent and how deeply rooted that is in the system, the, trust, the, the mistrust will generate from that point. And I feel that most of the complaints in the hospital they generate from lack of communication. And same goes for consent. So if the doctor at the time of giving or suggesting an implant or a sensor to the patient explains at the same time that your data will be used anonymously in safe hands, and you're having this sensor because before you, the people allowed the data to be used for research. So the patient sees the value of that. That if my data is being used, my name will not be shared. So the funny thing is that the patients don't share this concern. They, they just, when they go home, they think. They don't talk to the doctor at the time of the clinic. And that is the responsibility of the doctor to address without patient saying it. So normally what I do is when I give a sensor to the patient, uh, 
I tell them, look, your data is going to be seen at the level of the person who's providing you the care because he wants to know who you are. That's your physician. But beyond that, if it goes, it will be anonymized. And the value for that is that you are having this, for example, biostatic dressing or you're having this sensor because the people before that allowed validation on their data without their name being known. And then the person nods ahead, okay, that's okay then, if my name is not seen. And so you start building trust. And then we should do roadshows, like in Pakistan, in Lahore, we did multiple roadshows for new pulse oximeter. You give them, and you not only show the technology, you tell your data is safe, and same what I just repeated. So this exercise has to go nationally, internationally, at micro level, at macro level, in pamphlets, in leaflets, and that is important exercise, I believe. Right. Thank you. I, I think really that... agree with uh, your point, uh -huh. uh, Dr. Suhail. I think with my research as well, there's always this hesitation uh, among patients when you approach them and say we are using PhysiTrack to look at you know how many exercises or whether you are adhering to this. And they always have this question. And it's often difficult within the clinic environment to be explaining all that and then trying to get them to be involved in your research. So sometimes, yeah, absolutely, you have to give some information to them. They go back home, read it, understand what they are, you know, getting involved in, and then you communicate with them again. And then, you know, most of the time, 90% of the case patients are happy then. So that communication is very key if you want to get patients involved in 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 uh, you know in in, the, in these kind of activities definitely completely agree great answer thank you anush so i i think that because of the time i will end the panel discussion thank you everyone thank you thank you so thank you everyone for joining in this excellent uh, webinar and I request all the attendees to uh, point your smartphones towards this QR code and fill out the survey. And um, do, do join us for our next webinar, which comes up soon. And on behalf of the CCOT Rehab uh, Committee, I would like to thank uh, the moderators. I would like to thank Abra Fito for joining us in this collaboration and all our wonderful speakers who have come from across the world to uh, give us this new information about the use of AI and the use of variable sensors in uh, rehabilitation. Thank you all once again for this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.